Welcome. Welcome. Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? Good? All right. Well, welcome to Sultan. Thank you guys so much for coming on tonight for Tales of Tarpon with Ed Hoffman and John Terrapani. Um, I'm Gabriel Castaldi. I'm with the Tarpon Arts uh, over at Heritage Museum, uh, the Polar Arts Center, and the Culture Center, which you guys are standing in right now, and it's generally the Culture and Civic Service Department of the city. I want to say a special thank you to uh, Commissioner Coolios um, for coming out tonight, and uh, thank you guys for your best time. Now I'm just going to pass it off to the president of the Historical Society, Mr. Colar Ferris. Good evening, everybody. Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you for the Tarpon Arts Program for hosting us. And if you haven't been to any of their productions, it's a great, great program. We're very blessed to have them in our city. They've actually had plays in this very room, and they're fantastic. So anyway, thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to recognize those who serve on the board. So any of our board members, if you all could please stand. Eddie and John are on our board as well. So I'm one of the newbies on the board and they've been very kind to me and helped me show me the ropes a little bit, so I'm so appreciative of that. So anyway, it's going to be so much fun tonight. I'm so glad you're all here. I'm looking forward to learning some things. I just wanted to point out to you a couple things. First of all, um, who in this room is currently a member of the Historical Society? Can you raise your hands? Lifetime. Lifetime members. There you go. All right. There's a trump card. Okay. So if you are not yet on the in the Society you would like to be, there's a green form right here. We have some out in the lobby. We would love to have you join us just to help keep the heritage of our city alive, so um, that's how you do that. We also have a, a brochure that talks about the Railroad Depot Museum. If you haven't been to that yet, that is a treasure in our city. So we'd like to invite you all to come there and just see all of the wonderful things that the city has. And then finally, we have a brochure here about the Jitney, which is super fun. So um, that information is there. Of course, we have a website with more information and be happy to share with you anything about the society. And finally, I'd like to invite you, tomorrow is our annual picnic. It's going to be at Friend Howard Park, Shelter 2, at 11.30 a.m. All are welcome. So come on out. We're going to be providing fried chicken and drinks. It's going to be just a casual time. Bring something to share if you want to, but we'd love to see you there. So without further ado, I'd like to um, welcome our guests of honor, two of Tarpon Springs' favorite sons, Eddie Hoffman and John Terrapin. Talking back here and thank you. We should be coming out behind the curtain. All right, so here we are. Um, we have one mic tonight that we're going to share, and um, I think it's going to be a fun conversation. We, we're trying to cite, think of how long we should do this, and we thought, well, um, we should let you know that we've decided to put an intermission here. So about, about 45 minutes in. So if you have to go back, you know, hang on just a little bit. There's going to be an intermission because Julie, one of our board members back there, has put together. Uh, she always does great refreshments. So we'll do some refreshments for 10 minutes, and then we'll come back in. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, people will come back in. <laughs> or if not, we understand. And then we'll talk some more. And as John says, we, we don't know when we're going to end, but we may, when y'all want to leave, just leave, and we'll just keep talking. So, <laughs> so, that works. Yeah, that works. So anyway, I've done my talking, I think, for, for now. If you want to start, I don't We haven't rehearsed anything. We don't know what we're doing. Nobody can have fun. <laughs> John's got all kinds of stuff to bring, all kinds of his, uh, props. So he's, he's um, He's got his act together. Unlike me, I was going to do PowerPoint, but then it turns out they don't have the equipment here. Um, I didn't ask soon enough to get it to him. So, so John, if you want to start, then I'll so. follow up. And I'll do it. Follow me. 
So I got a phone this afternoon from a friend of mine and he asked me if I had my speech rehearsed. And Post your fight on that. And I said, no, I didn't have the speech rehearsed because I was chasing a bull for three days. And um, then I thought of my English teacher in high school uh, and she said, just do extemporaneous. So if you're going to do some of that. And then the other English teacher said to just do stream of consciousness. So that's going to just be a English Spanish speaker. So they didn't give us any real um, outline of what they wanted, but just uh, to, most people know my granddad was the, my grandfather Tara Panny was the new guy on the block for my family. He came to Tarpon in 1907. He came here for, like, as a Jewish immigrant from Lithuania um, with his mother and three sisters. So our father had died and they, they came to New York in 1904 and then they got here in 1907. And I, I'll circle back to the department store in a few months, but um, on my dad's and my mother's both sides, there all the other grandparents were pioneers. Light Townsend came in 1821, the year um, Florida was bought by the United States from Spain, and then uh, the Mazelles, his of the Mazelle thing came in 1835, and uh, if you look up the Mazelle Barber Tree, that's that's the uh, like from Mazelles. And the Whiters, my mother's family, they came early on to this area. They came in 1850s or so, little down Yellow Bluff, and then they moved around here. That was Marvel at the um, Walton Whitehurst, whose Walton Avenue was named after, was an early pioneer. He was a citrus grower, and uh, his son, Willard Walton Whitehurst, was a county commissioner when Tarpon Springs was part of Hillsborough County. And, his brother William Whitehurst was killed on the depot um, in a shootout with some guys he was trying to arrest. And his other brother, Marvel Whitehurst, was the first county sheriff in Pinellas County in 1911 when Pinellas County broke away from Hillsborough and they became Pinellas. You know, and, um, so we we'll can talk about, about, about that, but you know, as far as I was concerned, if they wanted to talk tales of Tarpon, well, I can tell you that I grew up in paradise, and uh, it's, it really was paradise. And you'll see with some of the props and some of the talk it, how, how it really was. And, uh, you know, we didn't have the Lowe's, we didn't have Home Depot, we didn't have credit cards, but we did have people starting there, from Tarpon Avenue and Tarpon Hardier, Mrs. Lewis, Mrs. Lewis and Mr. McCabe and Western Auto, which was who want to read. And we, had, we didn't have Walgreens, but we had a bank with drugs. And uh, that was a fun place. I mean, it's having a scene. Now, so, um, so we didn't have everything, but we had everything we needed. That kind of makes sense to you. Let alone your credit cards, when, you didn't have credit cards. So when people came into the stores, they just signed their name and came and paid when they could. When times were tough in Tarkman for the families, people didn't chase them for money. They came and they got shoes or you know, meat or whatever they needed and the stores would carry carry credit for them. And uh, you know, it was a real a real community. I mean, that's, um, and, the, and the town leader who was having a hard time and and so they accommodated the, the, the family and the community that way. But that's how I remember it anyway. We have, a, we have a movie theater. About, you know, Phil Demas was the manager of the movie theater. And um, sometimes on Saturday afternoons, especially when Eddie was there, he would get a little rowdy. And <laughs> Phil, Phil Demas would uh, get on stage, he'd shut the movie down, and get on the stage, and he'd say, Wives and girls, if you can't conduct yourself like ladies and gentlemen, I'll get forced to close the theater. And Eddie would hit him with a spitball. <laughs> 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 The train station. Wait, it was twenty. It was twenty-five steps. Yeah, I can it. Like it's, uh, you know, the trains were still running, and you were kids, and um, so my mom and dad would put me on the train. I, I mean, an aunt who was working in uh, Waycross, Georgia, and they were putting me on the train by myself, and I would end up at Waycross, Georgia, and then the same thing in both in Alabama. My son here in Jacksonville, and. Uh, of course, he helped with my name from Harsha, he's a big shot in the air with the train, I guess, but um, 
you'll be able to bother me and I always got there safe and came back by train too and I used to be on it. I still love to travel by train for that. I mean, uh, taking some great train rides around the earth and taking places in, you know, well, I don't know, take a break and leave you to yourself through accident. Uh, uh, I can tell you some boring stories. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of people in the audience. Some of them are our classmates. <laughs> and so, but as Tom Carson, who's also Dr. Carson, said, try not to let facts get in the way of a good story. So, <laughs> so they can, uh, <clears throat> don't don't heckle us too loud when we, we get off when we get off center of here. But um, just kind of a, a, a quick little introduction is that uh, my dad. Uh, going back to, I don't have the, uh, we're 1913 uh, is when my uh, grandfather came from, I think, Michigan. He was a doctor and a dentist and to St. Petersburg. And so then they, um, my dad, I mean, my grandfather died when my dad was, was um, 12 and um, during the Depression. And so he, he was a Depression kid, which is something that really probably impacted me greatly. You know, because he built everything. A lot of you know, he built a lot of airplanes. He built a lot of, you know, he's a designer and built a lot of things. And so one time I was in the barn up there. Uh, well, I'm getting a hot dog. I thought of the same thing, a stream of consciousness. I'm just babbling. That's another <laughs> word for babbling. So, so, so I'm babbling. But anyway. Uh, but he moved, he moved, uh, long story short, he moved us up to, uh, found this place in Jackson Grove, which was uh, on Lake Tarpon on Highway 19. Uh, and, uh, and I was four years old, and I had a sister, Shelly, two years older, and a brother, four years younger, John. And um, so it was just, it was paradise. Growing up there was, it was just terrific. But the kind of the, some of the early things I remember about Tarpon Springs, being four years old, was that um, my dad would bring us um, to, out to the train station. Actually, when we first, before we moved to Tarpon, I was three, we moved to Dunedin, into an old house, an old Victorian house right, right downtown, which had been torn down years ago. If Alta 19 went straight, we would have been looking right at it. You know, they rented it. They never had any money. My mom was a substitute teacher. The interior design business wasn't real great for, you know, in the 50s. <laughs> so it's not a big way to make money. But um, anyway, the, uh, in Dunning, he would always take us to the train station, depot. And so my sister and I, because my brother wasn't even around, <laughs> uh, would look in the, if we had a contest of who could see the train first, you know, turning around the corner, being done with the rail. And so when we moved to Tarpon, my dad would bring us downtown from out there on the lake where uh, Orange Grove, where Anderson Park is now, uh, the south, in the south section of Anderson Park where the big hill is. And so uh, we would come into town, and, uh, which by the way is the reason is the Tarpon Springs Area Historical Society <coughs> is because, uh, as opposed to Tarpon Springs Society, is because we lived right across the, the uh, city line there on Turk Road, on the south side of Turk Road, so we were technically not in Tarpon Springs. So, so that's what, how that got in there. Because my dad was president of the, the group here for 25 years and helped start it. But, but the, uh, so when we would come, the train depot and being there on the depot platform as a little kid, it was so exciting. And we would, my sister and I would be yelling, and we'd see the train coming around the bit uh, down, the, down the way there. And so he kind of passed that along to us because he did that in St. Petersburg with his father uh, when they had steam trains coming in. And uh, he talked about that being a, like a big animal moving into, coming into town, sitting there huffing and puffing. You know, it just made so much great sound. But I could talk about the depot for a long time, about Mary the Orange. They, well, they, had, they had orange crates and all in, in, the, in the depot, and they put them on the little wheel carts and get them over to the, to the boxcars. And yeah, 
it's just a really fun place, fun place to be. I remember the downtown. We'd come down and go to uh, to Bain and Drugs, uh, uh, the little park. Uh, it was this great little park in the uh, little band gazebo there. It was no longer there. It's in the parking lot now. Uh, and there was this little building, uh, Bain and Drugs, which was a fabulous old building. Had a was on the corner, uh, and so. That's where everybody went for to get something. Literally, an old-fashioned soda fountain. Mr. Uh, I don't think he, he wasn't considered a doctor. He was just a pharmacist. Right. So he was Mr. Bannon. Always Mr. Bannon. And he would always be in the back table, uh, sitting around playing cards. He and his buddies smoking a cigar. It's like a Yeah, smoking a cigar. The old fans going around. Uh, no air conditioning. There was no, never any air conditioning in Tarpon Springs, except, fortunately for us, the United Methodist Church, uh, the little chapel building that's there, not the other section, actually had air conditioning in it, along with uh, public grocery stores, if I remember. Those were the two air-conditioned spaces. No air conditioning at home or in school, even. Um, and, but it was fine. <laughs> it was a little hot. It was a little sweaty, but... Don't miss what count. You know, when we were little kids, we didn't care. Um, so, um, I remember the, uh, the Greek church. Um, oh, one thing about that park is all around, they had benches around it. We would always see some Greek guy with worrying beads. You know, that, was, that was always interesting. Uh, things that I remember or going over to the Greek church where they had a, uh, where now the statue is, that was actually a fountain, and it actually had these colored lights that were in, in the fountain, and the uh, they had big goldfish in there. Remember the goldfish were in there? Yeah. And so, yeah, I just want confirmation. So, <laughs> separate my my memories from my dreams. <laughs> and uh, so the um, uh, so I remember that and the restaurant across the street. Uh, how many people? It is named that place, Boston. But anyway, so that was great. I remember the old hotel um, uh, that was burnt out, that it burnt down, you know, the, the really big one down, the corner of Spring and, and uh, Tarpon Avenue. But the basement was still there, and there was always this big hole in the ground with the big heavy timbers that were charred uh, laying around down there. Um, and then the, um, and that was always interesting. And then the drive on a Sunday afternoon, we'd take my grandmother from St. Pete. She would come up and I remember, that's what you do, you know, the old days, what else do you do, right? You take a drive, Sunday afternoon drive, and go around Spring Bayou. And I remember being so fascinated by going up the hill there around past John's house, her grandmother's house, man, and looking up <clears throat> and being up on the top there and where Orange Street sends in, and looking across, and there's the uh, boat houses with these porches on top with roofs, and and these people are out there sitting out there, you know, in the in the afternoon, and evening, and playing cards and stuff up on that upper level, and uh, that's in some of the pictures, the old photographs. That was still here in the fifties, so I remember that. And we were going down to the sponge docks being a little kid and all the boats were bowed in because there were so many of them. And, and uh, being there and being on the dock, and you know, I was four years old and I remember pushing against the bow of the boat, the ships, they were on ships, they put it into the stick, and pushing on the bow of the boat and the boat, the boat moved. I felt like the most powerful little gun man in the world. <laughs> this, this huge ship. Uh, just funny little things that keep coming to me. Um, a little bit about um, coming into Tarpon. One thing that made Tarpon unique too is that it had these wonderful barriers that, um, not bar barriers, but uh, gates more or less, particularly coming from the, um, out there on 19 and Tarpon Avenue, that was all just a swamp. So I think for city, the, the, gas, the one gas station, but, um, but I remember coming into town, <clears throat> sitting in the back of the car, and looking out in the winter, and all the leaves are gone off of the cypress trees of the swamp. And looking out, and the, the, the sun, the south sun, 
coming across and the way it just sparkle, you know, through those trees. It was just, what a great time. And then you, then you came up a hill out of the swamp and then up and over, up by the great, the Catholic church, who's kind of on the hill around the right. And, and, um, and then the rolling, and then you just kind of pictured that these were sand dunes over a period of time before you got to the big one downtown park. And uh, so that was always great. Um, fun, fun memory. I remember uh, some of our closest friends when we first moved to Tarkin were the Vinson family, the Vinson Fionn on there across County Corner from the Methodist Church. And they were, see, we were always hanging out there. Bill Vinson was my first, first friend I remember because he was, he was an old guy there. He was five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's 20% of your lifetime bigger, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so and they had a bunch of boys. And so uh, during the week, my mother is a substitute teacher, and then became a full time teacher later, but um, we drop this off at, excuse uh, me, we'd be there. During the week, we would go to their house and hang out there, and then my mom, after work, would come get us and take us out to the lake, take us home. But uh, so we would play around downtown and had about uh, back there at the, behind the Vincent Film Home. Yeah, that was a great time. But the, um, it was. It was just, it was just wonderful. We were, although we were scared of the alley boys, there were fears. You know, we had fears when we were little kids, and uh, they had boogies where they had you know, switchblades. We wanted switchblades. That was the most scariest thing, you know, switchblades. I never had one, but, uh, but you know, I could think about Elvis Presley. You know, he did his movies with switchblades. I thought, no. But anyway, ah, I remember the, the, the theater. See an old yeller in there, and, and I remember crying so bad. No, the one I really got cried because I cried all the time. A lot of you know me; I'm an easy crier. <laughs> I remember being in there, and when the, it was Tom Sawyer and the, the movie, and he and Becky are lost in the in the remember in the cave, that cave scene. <sighs> horrible, that was horrible. So I was like, sure, crying because I'm so worried. <laughs> this couple in front of me. Make a big stink about it. But Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt bad. That was so scary. But then I was in, we were in there one night and in the uh, her day and, and the um, you're only in the, the daytime, but yeah, yeah, it's 25 cent ones. And then the, the alarm goes off, which is on top of this building, the uh, the siren, and uh, a whole bunch of the guys out of the theater, you know, jump up and go running out because it's the volunteer fire department. And uh, there is a story, Tarpon got out their fire stand. And which brings me to the story of this building. The fire department was in the front corner there, and that's where the, the trucks pulled out, about, you know, on that side of the building. And um, this side was in police department. And this side, yeah, it was police department before then. Then later on, they made this the, uh, to, uh, where, well, the chamber, I mean, the, uh, the City chambers for the uh, commission. Well, that was upstairs. Then I guess later they got there. The clerk's office was down there. Right. And the city commission used to be upstairs. Right. You're right. And the judge, Fedley, is with. <laughs> he was in here, though. Yeah, but he came here to be judge because he gave me my speeding ticket. He, he, <laughs> he, he didn't. I didn't say he gave me the ticket. That was uh, I can't remember that guy's name. I should, but he lived there in Tarkin. I got blamed for something that Alan Davis did. <laughs> no? No. Yeah. No, finally, it was that me, you know, was guilty, so. <laughs> that was my first speeding ticket fine. That was, but anyway, that's, that's a little bit later. But uh, just a little bit more about uh, Tarpon, I mean, uh, Highway 19. There was a light at Tarpon. It, Highway 19 was two lanes. Very little traffic on it, and uh, there was a light at, at uh, Tarkin Avenue. The next light wasn't until Dunedin. The next light after that was Drew Street, and then what it comes today. Back. So, uh, and then later, because there was a horrible accident, I think the kids, um, here damn who was, it seemed like we knew those people at, at uh, Tampa Road, and there was a horrible wreck there, so they put up a yellow flashing light. Um, and so, you know, just simple and very little traffic. My, we got our dog, my dad, 
was coming back because his office was stayed in St. Pete for quite a while before he moved to here to Tarpon on Hibiscus Street. He, uh, he was coming home and some people in the car in front of him threw a, threw a, uh, threw a little dog out the window. And uh, so, and the dog kept running after him, stuck him down, slugged down, and that was kind of, you know, going alongside this dog, and they finally got tired, and she went down and stopped. This is on 19, he's stopping on the highway. And <laughs> so he opens the door, and he kept, you know, the dog jumps in, and that's, that became our dog, Blackie. <laughs> and, uh, a little, little Blackie, but he was, he was a male dog that liked to cruise. And so he'd come down, one time we came to downtown Tarpon, and Blackie comes out of Boehner Drugstore. You know, <laughs> he's, he's having a good time down there. You know, but poor Blackie ended up, you know, meeting his demise there, you know, I team in front. But um, <laughs> that didn't work out so well, but he's a great, great little dog. Not for Blackie. A couple things to think about the uh, uh, highway was that because we did this traveling to St. Pete, because my grandmother being down there all the time. Sunday nights we'd come, come home and the, um, of course there was a Web City sign down there that was fun to watch. Went back and forth and put a real use of, great use of neon lights. But when we got to Alderman, um, Dad stopped the car on top of the hill. And, um, and we're sitting up on, there's an old 1951 convertible, and we sat up on the back, the three of us, kids. And then he said, you guys wanna, you kids wanna see us, see how far this car will roll? Okay, so we're stopped at night, <laughs> with the top down on US-19. He lets, he lets, he lets the brake off, and we roll down the hill, and, and, um, and then came rolling to a stop. And I think one car fast just the whole time. It's just, life was so good and so, <laughs> and um, later on, unfortunately, I guess I was like, you know, maybe 10 years old, right after they made it four lane, uh, there is a, a guy that owned the, gr um, the grove there, and, uh, where he uh, just coming, starting down the hill from Cod, and he's on the west, See on the east side. Yes. Is that Henderson Trail? He anyway. He he pulled out uh, from his driveway. And these guys were speeding on 19, and they they hit him, and so we came up on the accident. Uh, just my dad and I, uh, and the engine had knocked the engine completely out of the car. The engine was sitting there in the road, steaming, and somebody put a burlap sack over him. <coughs> He'd been thrown out, and the blood was running down. He just, but, but it was things that I remember as a kid that weren't necessarily so nice. So I'd say it was, we lived in paradise, but you know, that was, you know, like the, the guys in the car, I guess they were drunk, but they had, the car was down in the bushes and they were screaming. And, I can't agree with any yeah, I, I should have, but yeah, that explains a lot about why I'm a little crazy. But the, yeah, and um, anyway, the, the 19 was, you know, and then they made it four lane and that got to being a different thing. We had a horse out there at the lake and uh, the horse got away from me one night or one afternoon after riding it and uh, she, you know, I took the saddle off and took the bridle off and she just took off running. And I, oh no, it was, my, it was actually my brother's horse. <laughs> because I, I had the little sailboats and my brother had the horse. And so he, uh, so I speak. You know, just very distressing, losing the horse. I'd never done that before. And so the horse takes off, and it's Pepper, takes off, goes through the, uh, through the orange groves, right through past our, our barn and on up. And so we go running after it, our, our little dog, Duchess, that I got in the fourth grade from as a senior. So we go chasing the, chasing the horse, and then the horse had gone, but it had just become four lane at 19, and, about, and the horse, she ran across 19 and right on across up through the woods, which is now Tumpin Woods, I think it's called. I can't remember with that. I think that's subdivision there. Anyway, and <clears throat> so we've done this, kept going in, and Duchess could track her, because she had long gone. But Duchess kept on the trail until we went up this one hill at Old Van and Orange Grove, and it was so full of sand spurs that the fun I had to pick up Duchess and get home. And there with my dad later that night. 
I was, of course, petrified to have lost a horse. And then we um, had to, uh, we went and my dad, we found it. Found it the next morning. She was with a, a boy horse over there, in, <laughs> over, over there in uh, Pleasant Valley, which is. <laughs> That's a that's a fool, I never never make that connection. But that, was, that was my very first education. Um, um, from my dad told me about. Well, kennel horses sometimes they have this desire. That's gonna make a lot of sense. But you're just kind of dumb. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should let you talk for you. <laughs> No, keep going. Well, sir, some of our feet. Before I go any further, uh, Eddie and I have known each other since second grade, maybe even first grade. And, uh, Nancy was in our class, and um, probably some others, but we we stayed friends, and um, I think Eddie's got a photo he'll show you later of us in second, second grade, and I'll show you one after he got out of college and came home with uh, I felt that we were, um, but, but the tail of our cave was um, where the movie theater was, and had been um, closed up and uh, abandoned, and the roof was really literally fallen in, and we put a little group together and uh, this, and, uh, and restored the building. Eddie was the architect on it, so if you go in there and you see the mezzanine and the, the stairs and things, um, Eddie was the architect for the group that um, he restored the, the building back to an arcade. It was originally an arcade, and it was kind of interesting because they, they raised the roof in the back in order to get the heights so they used the good screen on the, the floor was sloped, and they sent bulldozers in and tore, tore that out. And because the roof had been raised, I was able to get a second floor in the back um, for additional stores. You know, it was a great project. Actually, that building, so you know, the clerk's office is on the National Main Street poster. They made the National Main Street poster for the worst they did on the building and for the, um, he made a plan with the city to do a streetscape plan that was adopted by the National Main Street Association for other communities where the property owners bought the site, the, the bricks, the concrete, the lights, the trees, the benches, and the city tore it all out and took our materials and put it back in. So it was adopted by the National Main Street Association. And that photograph is in the city post office. It's a collage of different buildings in the country. They make it look like a Main Street that fits all within buildings from different kinds. So it's a project we have some working on as we um, were younger guys. But, um, so I wanted to talk to you about the name Tarpon Springs because you, you hear different things. You know, over the years I've heard, oh, it's because the early uh, the early pioneers mistook I mean, mullet jumping for tarpon. No, I don't think so. And then uh, the Tarpon Spring, the tarpon were springing out of the spring, and that's why they knew it. No, that's not what happened either. I mean. It's a ghost of Manatee Springs, because namely because the manatees were jumping out of the water. So, it comes to that. so the real name of Tarpon Springs came because there were so many juvenile Tarpon in the bayou. And I can tell you, because I grew up on that bayou at my grandparents' house, the Tarpon come up and roll, and they sometimes they tail spines. But there were this, this the spring, which is really not a spring, was just full of Tarpon. And so that's how it got the name, Tarpon Springs. People thought it was a spring, and there were a lot of Tarpon, so it's Tarpon Springs. So I'm on the record as saying that's how the city got its name. It's getting that. Too. And I'm sick to the fact, you mean up there. So, um, like I said, I grew up on the bayou when I came home in the hospital. My grandparents had that house on the bike then. My grandfather he was European. And so everybody lived in the islands. My mom and dad, and three kids, and my aunt, Helen, and my third husband, and two kids, and my grandparents. So we all lived there. And, and, and then um, 1957, my dad, and my mom and dad built a house on Facial Drive. And at that time, the bayous were just 
the state in Maine. I mean, you can eat oysters out of the bayous. Mr. Ferguson, the real perfect pioneer, had brought um, Chesapeake by rail, Chesapeake Bay oysters then, and I am probably barrels or something like that, and they took them out in the bayous, out in Mr. Ferguson did, you know, to existing oyster bed, uh, local oyster beds, they, they felt them in two oysters because the, the shape of the, of the oyster on the front, if it was in the sand and you picked it up, it would look just like a, a raccoon track. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he planted these Chesapeake Bay oysters in Kramer Bayou, near the beds. So, mm -hmm. When I was young, we were young, I don't think, you could eat them. I mean, the water was so clean in the bayous, you could eat them. And uh, people from Tampa like, would actually kind of meet commercial oystermen would come and harvest them out of the bayou. To, you know, I mean, I can still visualize them with big ghost fogs, just still be a foot in both, you know. Like second taken back. Um, and he lived on Bayshore Drive too, we got lots of connections. Um, and then between his dad's house and my dad's house, there was a, a stormwater drain, like in the pipe down there, a big stormwater drain. And one day we were always out crabbing and getting you know, it. That's all we had to do. We didn't have iPads, you know, things all kind of so weird. Just out, you know, we were catching crabs and it, I met this sawfish, and what it is is sawfish, the big sawfish, the females came in from the bayou used to be a fresh water to spawn on, and they, they're like sharks. They, they give live birth, and um, this, this thing was about, they're about, about them all. And I would, I would wrap my net around this bill and drift him up on the shore, and I, of course, like, we had, to, it's all weird, great, you know, we were pretty for hunters or something, you know, but that's, that's from the Bayou, Kramer Bayou, when I was maybe 10 years old or something. And I, oh, beautiful. So that's, that's kind of the Bayou's in the, and back then, we didn't have air conditioning. And I, at night, we had so many monolith in the Bayou, that my, a harem or something with fly over the top, probably they and monolith and spook and they felt a charge of me. The whole school was just kind of exploding. There's so many fish that we wait to like. Then the main as probably you know, in the late 50s, in the early 60s. And, uh, but it was, anyway, the bayou, Spring Bayou was a big place to grow up too, because at that time, the Copeland Park was there, not Drake Park, Davis Copeland Park, and we, we had playgrounds and you know, we had a lot of fish. The boat houses that Eddie mentioned earlier, I don't think Tommy. Uh, his family on the boat from Los Angeles, and they had one of the big bird houses. I mean, so we had access to that as kids. And they were magically, we could go in, we were inside, and it was all this beautiful wood of it, and there would be any other tree, it was just probably cypress and pine, and yet, but you could pull a 40 foot boat in, into the birdhouse. You know, the stairs to get, I think it was talking about like a dance floor upstairs. The stairs were inside on in that burning house. So that was kind of fun and you'd be go upstairs. So the moat house for the tarpon then, you know, so I mean a lot of people don't realize that we could walk from street level straight out to to dance to all the plate mats on that one. And now I know truth the way it works. Um, that was a that was a big a big one. So it was not when I was growing up because we got there was, there was a lot of old timers in their family and old ways of thing as the what people they talk about stone breaks, you know, in the I mean, I was going up, you can go to Florida Avenue and you walk out front of the grass flats and put on by stone breaks. Right off the beach when they take take one of these you know, the stone breaks burrow like they're in a, a at the dope of this, you find the hole and you, you stick it down and you, you get behind the crab and you pull them out or you catch them in the a vicar's arm. And um, back then there was a, a lot of crabs and, and I already did your life boat out to Anglor Key to the ass flats to the, on, on the west side of the Dutchman Island in the North Key and Anglor Key. In the wintertime, that's the, the strand. 
from the time you go out, I mean, there would be, there's so much water, and you could just see the fab horse here, and I mean, Boombo Rider, uh, Flat Swing of London, that is, uh, it was, he and I went out one morning, and we got 170 friends, got Flat Swing, and just, I mean, if you wanted fab, you could go fab, and, you know, that's, and I was, you know, that's, now, that they may be able to use the stomach app books, but you can have 5,000 traps in a new if graphics. But you can't have a book you do all that kind of thing, but it's just kind of sad. Um, scallops, um, to go stomping, you know, we, we would just go to the sun for Sunset Beach, they call it now, it's called the Fear of the Year for now. You know, it's just, I uh, did a, uh, the number three watchdog, we put it in the year two bottle and tie it to your waist. You drag it out and just pick up scallops. So maybe it's the way we You know, and uh, the, the trick was um, to get, you had the minimum. When you can't move, your dad is going to make you clean your mom. So we didn't want to get more than you wanted to clean, which happened at the same time as the yeah. did. So the, the, the scallops were just, um, Anywhere along the coast, I'm out here. You could go to Bailey's Bluff and way down. You could go to Parver Watch. Um, I think there's one from there, but we call it the maze. We could go to Harbor Watch and way, way down. And uh, of course, scallops, as many scallops as we want to really or the neighbor in. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes you could go by boat. Um, one time, my Uncle Tom, he had this big neck of the boat. There's where he said neck of the boat. He made the setting to go along the uh, hill. Fourth inch collar, does one thing is it scallop adventure and put the scallops on the boat. It was my grandmother, my mom, my aunt Ellen, my brother, my sister, my two cousins. We went to Vegas Bluff and went getting the scallops in about eight or nine through the water. And I came up and uh, I was putting my dad at a long handle dip that and got them scallops and get my dad wrist down on the bow. And he was as white as those lights when I came up. Yeah. He couldn't speak. And I met, I do something one night and I, I was just happy to be under the anchor book and I grabbed the anchor book and threw my legs over the tight. You know, whatever. Ten foot hammerhead for right and yeah. I didn't go and what caused it was my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt would clean the scallops on the back of it, but it fell in the good school. <laughs> so they're chilling. Boys. And uh, so I didn't go in the water for about three summers. I didn't care about scallops. I didn't go in the water. That's got a one scallop. There's a lot of scallops for us, but that's one of the scariest. Um, so I told you about the oysters and the stung grass. You know what? Um, Mullet was the go-to fish farm, you know, it's, they were literally in Nazel and because of the fresh fish, and they threw and have a fish fry, you just went out and threw the cast, you know, to train the fish, and hang hunch butteries and pearl swamp, and potato salad, and pearl days, and um, with, you know, 4th of July's or Labor Days, anything like that was a, a fish fry time. I led, and some of the old timers, they used to go too old to go, and the thing what had smoked those, and then um, they would smoke fish, I mean, supplement their income. Some got out of the root gauze, you get picky good on um, Distant Avenue, got a smoke that it would pull about a hundred fish. And when you would smoke, and you know, people would follow our opinion, they would follow, you had a customer, a list of customers, and say, okay, anytime after two o'clock, I'll have the fish, and then, um, and they appropriately wrapped them in the leader, which was also known as the mullet wrap. Mm -hmm. So the leader was the local newspaper at that time, I think the name of that. And it's also known as the mullet wrap. Yeah. So they, uh, they, were, they were a great smoke fit, you know. So then in the, um, one of the other things, like, a lot of people don't know this, but turtles were, green turtles were commercially harvesting here. Um, that's a daddy, of it's a green turtle. And they, they would harvest them commercially by using some nets. Uh, they would run nets against the tide, and the turtles swim with the tide, 
and they get them and then get tangled in you. But go on, you didn't get down. We're going to take Harbor Watch it is on the north shoreline of Harbor Watch. There was a fish camp called Roberts. Old man Riley had a fish camp there. And he was a turtle, people called tourists or women. And um, if anybody had any sense, he could retire because Mr. Roberts would just butcher him and throw the shells out. The whole beach for 100 feet this way, 100 feet that way, were just littered with uh, shells like that. Um, so if you could have harnessed the boat or picked them up, you could make some probably a million tortoise shell. But, you know, Pappas Restaurant, one of their biggest sellers was uh, green turtle steaks at, at the time. There was a restaurant in the Sass up called the Green Turtle Restaurant. They that served it and they just, uh, so that turtle shell was one of the last turtles to commit suicide in America, Mexico. Basically, they jumped into the boat with nothing but right now. And, uh, <laughs> and we took it to his dad who uh, processed it for us. But um, no, we knew the law was getting ready to change and we didn't have a... Uh, the other way they caught turtles was with it in the dark. That went off the end, end of the pole went back. Yes. So they you you would mm-hmm. when that this one on the end of that pole and you risk them had to a wash them on it is to give them one of thing to go all the way in. What happened was is this case the shell ditches back like, down like that like you're saying, and then it, it keeps that from pulling out and uh and then when they got up to the boat, they put it in the boat and they had the peg in the base and they put a wing peg in it. They pull us out the wing peg in it because they want to trouble the bag because the troll be thinking on spoils of dollar and I said they didn't want to kill the they didn't want to kill the turtle until they were ready to process it. And um, so that's that's but that's what that is. That's a turtle peg that they punished the turtle. Not commercially, but for your house, if you want air turbo, you can make sure there were a lot of them, so you just went and got one. You know, if you could find one that Mr. Bowers had in the in his net, you know, and um, said, so That's a little bit of a spring. It's, of course, Tarpon Springs, you know, it's like I mentioned, there's a lot of tarpon in, in the spring, small tarpon, but out in the Gulf, you know, they were big fish, you know. They, 100 pounds, 150 pounds, 200 pounds. And you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but in the late 1800s, early, in the quarter, first quarter of the 1900s, the they tarpon were a subsistence fish, and the people would harvest them to eat. Um, now they consider a game fish. But back then, they, um, early on, they would take Big nets you go around the school, and then they would tie their lower skips or whatever they were in up around the, to, the, to the court line. And yet, these, these, these circles would be two or three hundred yards. They didn't want to pinch the fish in too much and they go crazy. So, they put a big compass around them. You can tarp them when they come up to the net, they'll, they won't bit the net, they just, just follow it around. So they're tied up to, to the net. The boats are tied up to the net. And when these fish come by, they're the harpoon, you know, it's something like that, you know. Maybe a good time, it has a, it has a door on it. And, and then it was this line and the door goes in, and hangs out, it's that. Go like tarpon. You just got line. You just you know, put it to your body. So when the dart goes in, it turns sideways to pull against the fish that so doesn't pull out this step with a flare to it, so it, it turns. So they just, you know, I'll, I wouldn't want your money to get a tarpon to not be able to eat it. So, um, I brought you a recipe for 
Barton Burgers, the fluency of David Fan, of Haley's Blood, okay, that's a, that's a really, that's a really true recipe, and, um, spooks we all use. You can pass this, and this is the multiple of, that's a big Bailey, this is published in the 20s, and, um, you know, one of the, another Bailey, and that for his gospel, but then I'm sure the nearest Nancy Buckle just had it out. The thing, I the whole, um, so the fish that you see in these photos, they, they weren't killed and, and cut up and, and wasted. They were, uh, some, they would smoke the top of the back. I mean, they thought they were made by uh, fish padding inside or uh, the rest of the meat. You know, and, uh, they really, they really, I know it sounds a little strange, but they really, really good. Um, so, I um, Bob, even on our board, his, his dad and I were great friends, and we used to go on fish night, too. It's the end of the way that he did it, tart and back through, and he was on. Um, there's a thing called the Bible Messing. Bible from Bible Messing. Bible Messing, thanks. Um, in, in the water, hey, it is, you wait it so you moon, which is dark and you move and the two days you go a few days after you got on the oil. You work with the people in the south too. Like the tarpon schools will come in in like May and June. You uh, on the top playing was calm and it was dark nights. You could go out with your boats. And I see that it's so bright that the fish when they're swimming in front of me, you you can see <clears throat> we can actually see individual scales from the side of the fish. You can see their eyes. We had them um, really harpoon you at night. The first four ants were uh, food. I mean, the next day, uh, when you brought them in, you just call some of the old timers and maybe they would, uh, they would come and you fillet them. And uh, if you've never seen the tarpon scale, here's a, a few scales off. Some fish that uh, you probably got some I thought to do it. Then, but you can't do it anymore because at that time there were no lights on the coast. Um, the power plant wasn't there, it was just kills you. If there's, if there's lights, but it has to be perfectly dark for you to, to see the fish. <coughs> um, we we would do it south for a while, but then you had too much light, then the power plants went in and things like that. And, and if that takes time, then we'd move with time. There's no foot power park. No, no, foot power park didn't do anything. So, like the last year we were in Mexico. So, when that kind of interrupted uh, this year, basically. So we couldn't look down the coast as easy as they did. Now they go out, you know, really, really. <clears throat> but still, we can catch far from the interior, but must stay in the daytime by hook and line. The um, here, you know, somebody's saying it's time to take a break. So, yeah, words for me. What we're All right, so we'll take a, we'll take a quick 10 minute break. Uh, maybe you can look at some of John's photos and, I don't know, tap on the shell or something. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, and so we'll be back here in 10 minutes and do the other, we'll ramble on some more. <laughs> I think I should probably take this moment to, with John having 
head it off to the boys' room. I can start talking bad about him before he gets back. Uh-oh, here it is. <laughs> but I will tell you, my poor John, he's actually a really old guy. And, you know, because, you know, in this picture, it shows that, yeah, we're together in the same class, but he was much, much older. I think he was, what, one week? Uh, a couple of days, what, when's your birthday? Oh, the 21st. Mine's the 22nd. See, he's a day older than I am. <laughs> I was in Mountain Park Hospital, downtown, uh, downtown St. Pete, with being born the, on Thanksgiving Day, with all the windows open, and as uh, apparently it's a beautiful day. Poor dad and sister had to go to Morrison's cafeteria for lunch for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You want to do some more? Oh, okay. Well, that's more interesting. All right. So, okay. So, I've covered the part about you being an old guy. Uh, day old. <laughs> I thought it was a week. Maybe that's Jake, Jack St. Um Well, a, little, a couple of things about downtown. There's an ice. We talked about this the other day. There's an ice, the ice plant, uh, which was on Safford Avenue. Um, and my dad would like to go, he loved watermelon, and uh, so he'd put, you know, put a watermelon or two over at the ice house so he could put them upstairs on the ice and uh, then just drive by later on and pick them up because nobody had a refrigerator that big. Um, which also, everything reminds me of something, like refrigerators. Yeah, the Hood's uh, milkman when he'd drive around there out at the lake on the dirt road with his milk truck and it had ice in it to keep the milk cold, he would come around and, and actually bring uh, the milk, open up the back door, around to the back of the house, and open up the back door and come in the house and put it in our refrigerator and, and then drive on. In the, in the summer it was fun because he'd give us chunks of ice so we'd play with, you know, kind of cool off in the ice. That was, that was good. I don't think I don't think I look like him. I guess I still look like my dad. <laughs> that, so, well, that, was, that was after that was after I was born, so there's no question. But uh, I'll see. Oh, um, well, I got a bunch of things on the, on the list. Let's see. Go down. Um, oh, not only the ice house, but then there was also the um, Purina. Uh, you uh, know, feed store there, which is the Quonset Hut on South Safford, and that's where we would get our uh, get our little baby ducks and you know get the little chickens and stuff that Easter or whatever. Yeah. And uh, so that was that was always fun. But the nice thing is because when we got the horse, they had a room back there, and it had a it had all the saddles and bridles. It was a tack room, right? Sales and boy, it smelled good. Um, back in there, kind of inspired you to get on a horse. And uh, although riding the horse in the Orange Grove was, yeah. was kind of fun. Uh, when I coming down the hill and, and the horse, she, Pepper, she just decided to stop. And just, I mean, stop. Yeah. She's a quarter horse, she's pretty good at stop. <laughs> Flying, but because they till it, the, the sand was soft and it was fully survivable. So that was another little thing. The um, Let's see. Um, Cub Scouts, we had, uh, you know, I was in uh, Troop 48, and, uh, or PAC, PAC. Troop, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, PAC. So there's a PAC, Met, Met, a Methodist church, and um, we made it through Bear, I think, Got to Wolf, then to Bear. And, but the, uh, and I remember, the little thing, Chippy Williams, he became a, Superstar basketball player. He, he was my neighbor. He grew up to be six foot nine, high uh, point score for the uh, uh, SEC for basketball, and played center. And uh, but anyway, he I remember the Boy Scout meeting. He, my dad called on him to my boy. Dad was one of the leaders, and asked him, called on him to um, say the Pledge of Allegiance. And so. And he did the salute, and he said, going just two fingers, our father. <laughs> he, was just, he was so nervous, and, and just one of those funny little things that sticks with you. 
for reasons I don't understand. But in Cub Scouts, we also get to do, you know, um, kind of career day where we we went out and all had jobs. And so, so I was in the fire department. I was one of the firemen for the day. But then we also were trading off being the policemen. We arrested more. It was here in this because the fire department was here. So we were in the in the building, up, you know, on the front corner in there, in the garage where the uh, they kept the some of the engines or one of the engines and. But we also would go out and arrest people left and right uh, for uh, jaywalking because it's illegal to jaywalk, right? <laughs> so we would we would grab a hold of <laughs> our little Cub Scout uniforms, we'd drag it down, we would take them upstairs where there was a judge, <laughs> Cub Scout judge, you know, and uh, you know they would t take care of them. Nobody got put in jail, but it was <laughs> it was good. Uh, and let's say the. Uh, no, let's see. Oh, oh, um, another little thing was the first day of, of elementary school. Th we didn't have kindergarten in Tarpon Springs. Yeah, there wasn't one. And so everybody started, uh, the, Johnny and I were late because we were in November birthday, so we were some of the youngest in our, in our class. But the, um, but the first two weeks, since we weren't prepared for school, we, we they would only have us from, what, eight, eight o'clock or something or morning until noon. We got out at noon instead of 2.30. So um, my mom told Mrs. Sexton, who was my first grade teacher, that um, she wouldn't be able to pick, pick me up. So Mrs. Sexton took me uh, after school, the 12 o'clock thing, out all to 19 to uh, uh, draw a blank on his name. Woody Woods or something. Anyway, to drop him off in Pleasant Valley, and then she was going to come drive back into town. When I say Pleasant Valley, I mean right there at Clustering Road. Was now come back and, and go to Tarpon Avenue, go out to 19, and then go to where basically Anderson Park is, Took Road, or actually past Took, and go up over the super hill, which is really scary actually, and but fun. And then to, um, but when I, she dropped him off, I said, Miss Sexton, I, would, I remember standing up on the back seat and over her shoulder, right, she's driving up to tell her, you don't need to go all the way there. You can take this road and it'll go to my house. And she, you know, five. <laughs> <laughs> and she, and this is a, a shell road, just bumpy to bumpy to bump totally washboard that wound its way through the woods, pine trees and, and turkey oaks, um, and over the hills, and, and wind all around, and, and she trusted me. And so, so, so she took me, and then we came out to 19, to Lane Highway 19, and I said, if you turn there, take a, I didn't say take a left, I'm not sure I knew the difference, because I hadn't been in Cub Scouts yet. So, left and right, they taught us that in Cub Scouts. You know, right face, left face, drill, drill team stuff. But, <clears throat> so, and then you just went, you know, a quarter of a mile, and then boom, you're you're right there at our place. And, we, and she was so impressed that uh, I could lead her back to my house after it saved her a lot of time. And, uh, so, but that but that was Clostermann Road. And uh, so, um, let's see what else the uh, oh the lake um, was. Then it was brackish because there's a connection between Spring Bayou and Lake Tarpon right in front of the park there, kind of towards the south end. And so we always had barnacles because uh, that salt water would come and go occasionally. And so the lake always, uh, there's enough salt, at least around where we were, to have barnacles. So all the cypress seeds that would come up there in the lake in front of the house, yeah, um, which also had a lot of alligators in it, but would come up and they, the barnacles would be on the on the cypress knees would stick up. So they were a little tricky when you're a kid. Or there was a, a because of the orange grove, there was a, a dock that was between only two houses on that 40 acres. My parents rented our house for $50 a month for the entire time we were there from until the um, I was in 10th grade when we moved to a, a new house in, in, in Tarpon. But the, 
it had a big pipe from a from a pump out underneath the dock, and we'd have to uh, be really careful when you were chasing each other around the plane. You'd have to get up, go over top of the, uh, the the pipe, which was covered with bundles. And then, uh, but fortunately, the pipe stopped before the end of the dock because underneath the main part of the dock out there, which was pretty high off the water, we'd play bombs and subs with this other family, Chippy, that here's when I told you about the basketball player. Yeah, his name later became Dennis Williams. Uh, he got a pretty, pretty big shot, you know, sports well. But he, he, they had five kids in their family. There was only three in ours, but, but the Vincent boys would be there. But we'd all be on that dock and we'd play bums and subs. And the deal is, you would, you know, everybody would be down, down below except for a few people that were on top that were the team that was playing, playing the bombs. And the idea is to, to swim out under the brackish water and see if you could go out and come up before you got bombed. <laughs> because the other kids, you know, the idea for the bombs, they were just to just jump in and, and, you know, jump on top of you when they saw you going. So nobody got killed during that. But one time, Chippy, <laughs> Chippy came up, and I remember I was one of the bombs, and he, he got up, and, and there was this alligator right behind, right behind him. <laughs> We were little kids, but um, the gator didn't really ever bother us. So we were, we, you know, we never, it never really faced us for some reason. Why well, I don't know, because uh, kids, nobody really had problems with gator. Dogs, they did catch some dogs, and that's uh, that was a problem. Um, but the lake, the one thing about because of this connection, that sometimes uh, it would flood. We'd have the summer rains, and it would flood. The lake would come up, and because the the, uh, the the canal out or the, the spring out, then it'd be kind of in reverse back to I don't know what you call that, but it reverse itself and come up and spring by you, and uh, so so the the flood would come up underneath our house. We had an old crack. It was an old cracker house. I was always embarrassed by it because it wasn't a cool new block house. It was just an old frame house with this an old screen porch that we'd sit around on, and. and uh, so I thought that was really cool. My dad fixed it up great inside. It was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, at the time, you know, I, I hooked up strings that would come off the the um, the, the porcelain light sockets in the bedroom to a, a little chain and take it over to a little pulley to another pulley and then down the wall so I could have the could turn on the light right next to the door just like rich people, you know, the light switch. <laughs> so, but, and I didn't realize then, of course, how just what a blessing you know, of paradise that was. But at the time, it was it was kind of cool. <laughs> but um, oh, so so the lake comes up and it, but the house is on stilts. It's on, like I say, old cracker house. It's about you know a foot and a half off off, the, off grade, and, and the lake would flood. It would come underneath the house and go all the way over. You know, probably in a hundred yards, but fifty, seventy-five yards to where then it goes up the hill. And that's where the barn was, and that's where we'd park the cars during the flood. And then take a boat and paddle it out to the, uh, to the back of the house, or to the, uh, to the uh, kitchen back door, and where there's a 55-gallon drum for the, for the oil heat. That's the only heater we had, which was a new thing, because it started out for the first couple of years. We didn't even have any heat, it was all just a fireplace. And uh, so it got kind of chilly there in the winter too. But but so we'd tie the boat up to the to the uh, to the uh, drum rack, and uh, then we'd hang the because we didn't have a dryer or anything. So we had a, uh, but we didn't have a washing machine. We'd hang the hang our clothes up, and that was a fun job even as a uh, kid. That's the only time of life did any work, but it was fun. Is that hanging up. Um, the clothes on the clothesline that was out over the water. We'd do that with a boat. But then we'd also take a boat, t paddle the boat down to the to the other, because we'd all get lined up in there and paddle, you know, like Vikings, you know, with well, three on either side of the, this uh, giant boat, and uh, paddle. I remember seeing a gar fish. The first time I'd seen one, I thought it was prehistoric, scary thing. And uh, <laughs> so, but, um, Anyway, so that was that was great, and then you'd come home, get off the bus, bus sometime, come come home, and then 
boom, all the water be gone. And the water be gone just way. We'd have sand way out for a long way. And the um, and I always thought how exciting it would be that if it just went on some more, then we'd catch all the fish, just walk out there and pick them up. But they were capping, of course, and yeah. would come back and things were normal. But it was, again, another piece of paradise to, to be out there on the lake at, at those times. Um, so I'll let you talk for a minute, and I'll catch it. Yeah. Um, and see. So uh, I was talking to you about the, the things that we had just kind of disappeared, the stomach grabs, and you know, I mean, if you don't have a commercial boat, and if you all the pay big bucks, you know, you're not going to hook one anymore, and you're in mode, and I'm like I used to be, and yeah. But you know, one thing has increased, like when I was, when we were growing up, there were no manatees. I mean, maybe somewhere, but not like, like in the winter now, it's, it's from when I house is 15, 16 some days up sunning. So the manatees have made it, you know, that's an encouraging thing that manatees have made it come back and there's a lot more of those, which we, we're thankful for it. The, uh, since there's a couple city commissioners here, I would say that, you know, I think it's a travesty if Tarkin Springs launches into the manatee migration zone, one of the, one of the two launching manatees launches out of the manatee migration zone. I mean, they should look at, um, they'd have to spend money on land. They should look at land, proper boat launching ramp, probably the other thing and get out of the manatee migration zone. But it's like, yeah. <clears throat> and, um, and um, I told you about how pristine the bayous were. And this is this is literal. This is not made up stuff. But I don't, I was maybe, 10, 12 years old, you could catch, in the wintertime, you could catch a trout every cast for the spotted sea trout. Not big ones, but like school, they call them schoolies, you know, small ones like that. But you could, for a kid, that was really something, catch a trout every cast. And in redfish, um, somewhere I have a picture of my brother and I with school redfish, like this big, we are little, but we have a broomstick over our shoulders and a string of redfish, all from behind the house on Prima Bike and any other. And, and that, that is, what happened was the oyster beds got killed, fine. Pollution and the uh, sand went off or something. So the, the fish aren't there like they used to be because the, the, the oyster beds are pretty well dead. But um, anyway, it was. A great thing to see growing up and having fun. And uh, Eddie was, you know, he talked about the scouts. Well, I was in the sea explorers. Uh, Bart Michler had a big ranch out north of town. It was a big ranch. I mean, it was eight or 10,000 acres. It went from Angel Road to 64 and from 19 to the Gulf. That's how big it is. And I'm um, and uh, Bart Michael was a scout master, and little Bart was in this in, in with us. And then, oh, it's still Bart. yeah, it's still little Bart, yeah. And uh, he's a big guy, but he's little Bart. And, uh, but so we had the sea explorers, and, and Bart somehow managed to because he had this big ranch and he had a big picnic area and big pastures. To, to, he sponsored the statewide scout jamboree, and uh, that was a big deal for him, right? And so, um, Glenn Boatwright, Mickey Lang, me, Nathan Bowles, like the whole, the whole troop, we just about, his, his property went all the way to the Gulf. So we went down because we knew where we were. And we covered a bunch of blue crabs and we snuck back to the camp. We put the blue crabs in the sleeping bags and some of them were oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, We got the troop thrown out of the jamboree. It's not so good. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, they did. They did let us back in, but it was pretty ugly. You know? And then, uh, but we had we had worked hard to do this. Jamboree. We had gone and um, caught. I think we caught all the mullet to do a, a jamboree at the a creek. You took a you took a mullet net, a gill net. It's called stop netting. You wait for the tide to come in. There's this big creek. 
and you let the tide come in, and then you run the net across the mouth of the creek and wait for the tide to turn. And when you, and the fish can't get out, they're, they're, you know, they start dropping into little holes in the creek, and then you can cast that amount. And um, so we cast those old fish and got them cleaned and stuffed with June bread. We had the big fish fry, and then had some fun with boys and crabs and your sleeping bags. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking of crabs, to my daddy said, this is kind of a stream of consciousness. When you say something, it makes you think about something else. One of my first jobs was uh, the guys in Tarpon like to go to Boca Grande and the Tarpon fish, Steve Smurlis, Smurlis Bakery, and Papa Murray Deitch, and my dad and all his buddies, they all, my Bob Goss, they all went to Boca Grande. Well, to go down there, if you buy tarpon bait, the pass crabs, you pay an arm and a leg because they got you captivated there on the island. And um, so my job was to catch little blue crabs, which the bayous were full of, about this big, and um, take the pincher, take the claws off so that when they reached in the bait bucket to get a crab, they didn't get bit. So I got 25 cents a crab, so I was making big bucks. And, uh, <laughs> At the time, you know, it, was, it wasn't anything to catch three or four dozen for their trip. You know, they, they won a few dozen because they were going for a long weekend or something like that. So, and another thing about blue crabs was in September, you could go to the mouth of the river and go to one of the creeks, or go to the mouth of one of the creeks on a high tide, wait for it to turn, where the blue crabs would just come swimming out of the creeks and you just dip them up as they came out, and, and they swam in the water column, and you could see them because the water was there. He just dip them in, uh, and did washed up, and then people like my mom, and Joan Criticus, and people like that would pick them and make devil crabs, and, 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 and they would stuff them back into shells. They'd, they'd take the crab meat and stuff it back into shells and bake them, and, that, and that's how it was served. Same thing with um, early on with stone crabs. You could keep the whole male crab, so they picked the, they picked the stone crab bodies, you stuffed them back in the shells and then ate the claws like, like everybody eats them now. But at that time, you could keep the whole male claw, whole male crab, and you, you couldn't touch the females, and, which sounded like a better policy to me than them. Um, so that's that, and then, um, here's, here's, a, here's, it's a little bit of a fun split. So, I had this, my dad, the captain, my brother and I had, had a 14 foot skiff, like a, he had like a little way low and it wasn't a way it was just a little bit like one. It had like a 20 horse kicker on it. And Eddie Ruth, who was a classmate of uh, Eddie's and Nancy's and mine, and then Mike Jones, another classmate, she would skiing and uh, river now. Fred Howard wasn't there, so we came around the river and, uh, and on, it turned south and um, we weren't supposed to go south of uh, Seabreeze Island so that they would know where to look for us. Couldn't go north of the tracking stations, which is a different story, and couldn't go south of Seabreeze. But we, we stretched a little bit and went down to uh, what's now Sunset Beach. We followed the chair. And the, the Greek yayas, on, on high tide, like to sit in the water in your, your black swim suits with a kind of little dress stamp on the bottom of it. <laughs> And sit and just shell water like that and have your chats and whatever. Well, we came skiing by there. I'm pretty sure it was Eddie. It couldn't have been me in that. Not because on a different Eddie Ruth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, well, it's super long now. Yeah. And kind of leave like that, you know, and just cover these ladies. <laughs> so we took off, you know, laughing our ass off. And uh, so we got there and I thought, let's make another land. <laughs> Yeah, the neighbors are in the small town. When they came back around, my dad was standing on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and I was only going like this. <laughs> you go home. Uh, I think I lost the juice of the boat for a couple of weeks. And, uh, I, mean, but it, I guess it was worth it. <laughs> 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 The Greek ladies, they were always like, girl, well, I need this, I need this, I need this. Yes, yes. See, so, I think the Janaris family, uh, George, uh, Mike Janaris and Nelson Fingas had a son, George, 
and he was just a couple of years older than me. We were pretty good size. He went to medical school in, um, in Duke. And when he came home, his father was a sponger, had a boat. If, uh, LCM was the name of the boat, a real sponge boat, a, a GM design sponge boat. And when George got out of medical school and, and to, that, to be a doctor, his dad wanted to take George on the boat so he could see what he had to do to make George, uh, to put him to school to be a doctor. And, but, well, I got invited along <laughs> to this trip which sounded like a great trip to me. So um, we, we went out on this boat and it was really it's amazing for a couple of reasons. One that is the, um, Mr. Generis, who owned the boat, Captain Generis, you know, we went out and as soon as we passed in, uh, Lighthouse Island, we just kept going. We were out of, we were out of sight of land for a week. Then uh, when we, when we came back, and I was wondering, you know, if I thought, well, we'll just head east, we'll, have to, we'll see the coast, and we'll go north, we'll go south, and we figure, you're gone to a wheat, and you hit Anklo Key. No GPS. The only thing you had was the early GPS, which is the compass in bottom. And, and how he tracked it, I guess the GPS was in his head. He knew we went this way for so long, and you came back this way, but I'm telling you, he, he hit the Anklo Key light right on it. And, um, and the GM boats, I, I don't get seasick, and I didn't get seasick on the boat, but it can be slick, calm, and those boats go like this. They never quit doing it. You don't get throw on. We get to the dock and the sponge docks, and we, we tied up. I stepped off the dock, say that, and, then, and I'm like, I went straight to my knees and went, and <laughs> <laughs> so, You know, and, um, but it was, it was supposed to be a three-week trip, by the way. Uh, at the end of a week, we were begging him to take us something. <laughs> and, uh, so, but I think George, you know, appreciated it and for what his dad went through to uh, make a living to the family and put him to the school and um, things like that. So that was that was a great um, a great experience. Go go up and you know it's just you know it's things like that that you know, they made tarp. I mean. Um, People take control of each other and, and the, then back to the sea explorers, Bart was a, I mean, he was a great guy. He, he took us to the Keys two or three times. We would go on, we would caravan down, the only guys would drive, and, and we would go to the Bahia on the bridge, there's a camp down there, and we were a tent camp in the Keys. You know, if you can imagine that. And, um, you would swim on for the the the, 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 rank, the rain patrol or rangers, whatever they were at the young. And, you know, we were scouts and they would turn their heads. They would tell us, you know, if anything you catch on shore, you can swim on shore and get, you know, we had small boys and stuff. We were eating fresh crawfish every night. You know, they were shorts and they were out of season. <laughs> and, they, and those guys, they were nice enough. They didn't uh, bother us, but it was. A big time, but eat fresh crawfish out of, out of the water. Mm -hmm. And then years later, um, Robbie Dawson and I, he was doing expeditions to the Keys. And uh, we would really gear up and go. And um, at night, they do this thing, it's called bow netting. They have a, like a fab nose going this way instead of this way. Being you have lights, underwater lights that ran off generators, and the crawfish come out and walk on the banks at night, and we can see their eyes. And and you drop that net on top of them, and they jump up into it and get tangled up, and you put them in the boat and those, and shake them out. I mean, sometimes we would get 50, 60 a night. It was crazy. And, but we, we had free, we took freezers with us and stayed in little cheap motels and had fun. And it says, really, he, uh, Robbie and Pete and I fished from um, the Sand Key Light, which is south of Key West, to the north of Steel, north of Steel Hatchet, and hunted and hunted that coast. And, you know, it was, it was 
just a different world. I know, as you, you can imagine, I mean, there was no, no hard of watching, no playing likes of us. And it's, I think Daddy's dad's house and my dad's house, and for a long time, were the first ones there, then some, um, and Bartel came, which was okay, because it was three good looking sisters. And, um, <laughs> I was, but then they, they sure come along. You know, we, we, and it was so vacant back then that um, in between Sunset, Barrel, and, and Bayshore, it was all woods. And we had these forts out in the woods, and the, the Bayshore kids would have wars with the Sunset kids. And, <laughs> and you know, Pine Village was the preferred choice, the preferred weapon at the time. Was, you know, the, it, you know, it was now there's a subdivision at uh, West Bay Shore of Subdivision while they got across from Nettie's dad's house and not. But, you know, there was um, artifacts and, you know, Indian stuff, you know, and, and the, the manatees were a food source for the Indians. And um, where Mrs. Progus's house is, was a big Indian camp. And then before they built their house, there were mere kids. We, uh, we found a tailbone off of manatees, and mm -hmm. we didn't know what it was. And my dad said, "Well, you take it to Mrs. Winslow; she'll figure it out." Mm -hmm. That was Hel Helen Craig Winslow, and um, she was just a charming, sweet, uh, fantastic teacher. I think she was something in the military during World War II, like a women's auxiliary corps. Or she was some kind of spy, and where she was. Because, you know, it took her a couple of weeks and she, she uh, told us, she goes, it's a manatee, um, manatee tailbone. She had done research and so it was a key, it's a real high spot in between the bayou and the river. And it was just like a perfect place for the Indians to camp. And then, so I was, we used to go up there and have forts and little gangs and I, uh, that was, that was fun of them. I don't know, okay, we we'll didn't about talked out. And the, the only thing is the president's talk was just like I said, I could not talk about certain things. I don't want to cite a diet. So is yeah, say it. Yeah. <laughs> well you can you can mull on that for a minute, John. Um, just back to Highway 19 and, and growing up there next to the lake, the there was a tarpon zoo. Which is where that nasty building was they built, and now this, they've just torn it down. And uh, here on the north, excuse me, the east side, uh, it was pretty close. I guess that's, it was close to the you know, K or, you know, right across the street there. But anyway, that's where the Terrapin Zoo was. And so, because we're, our place is just, just down the road a little bit, uh, the uh, down 19. We had, we ended up with some zoo animals that would get away. And we had, there were two monkeys that on our 40 acres that with the other neighbors in, in our house, it was Jaco, Jaco and Coco. Wait, you guessed male and female, I'm not sure we knew the difference. And um, they, um, they were up in the tree in front of our house, uh, in the little cracker house, and there was a pretty good sized cedar tree and my brother and I were up in the tree, and and uh, Coco was up there uh, in the tree with her tail hanging down, and my brother just couldn't resist. He was up there. He was he was uh, preschool, and so I guess he was five. And and he he grabbed the this is in the summer. He's just in his little shorts. I'm in my little shirts, and so he pulls he pulls on uh, Coco's tail. Of course, Coco, you know, and scared him, and he fell out of the tree, and he broke. And when I got down, he he stood up. He was just kind of looking at me, and his arm was turned 90 degrees, you know, dangling down like this. So of course, we all start yelling. And my mom, because it's summer, she just in her underwear, and that's the way we live. By the way, that's the way people survive some of that. So she goes up. So she freaks out. So she just runs back, gets her, puts a blouse on and some shorts, and I don't think she bought shoes, not from the old car, and uh, took her to took him to Doctor Thompson's house, and um, 
you know, where his, uh, actually, they have been in his office, I don't know, but they just disappeared, and then he came back with a big cast on. And uh, so that was a little thing with the zoo, but also that when there's a big sinkhole that's still there, I think it's all fenced off now. Um, and we, we were down in kind of that sinkhole, because it's pretty deep and kind of jungly, and we found this, this God, it was, a, it was a baby dinosaur, for Pete's sakes. It was this, this big old dinosaur thing. And so we were thinking, should we catch it or should we not? So it went, but we figured if we could catch it, baby dinosaur will take it to the zoo. Well, it turns out it was a um, iguana that had gotten out of the zoo, a pretty good size one. <laughs> and I never know anything about iguanas. And Florida doesn't have iguanas, at least our neighborhood. And, <laughs> And so, so I, we thought we could get some money for it. <laughs> I think he said he'd give us a dollar to bring it back, but I don't think we were able to catch it after that. But um, also, um, the Orange Grove was was great for it. it. Was so great after school. Again, there was this road that went. It's no longer there, but road that went up right over the top of the, the hill, way up over top. And there was a one, and the uh, Orange Grove was terraced. And so there was a, a royal palm at the end of each one of each row. So it's really kind of an elegant, gracious place, but go up to the top, and then there is a hellacious drop down. So we get off the bus stop, we'd go up there, and we'd, we'd just pick up, we didn't pick any fresh, but we'd pick up the old grapefruit that had fallen, and we'd roll them down the road, and they would go across 19. So they'd be coming out of nowhere, you know, we'd, and there wasn't that much traffic, but, you know, Somebody goes splat swat, you know, and they thought that was so much fun, <laughs> you know, and, and um, <laughs> well, I won't get into that either. But, it's a nice story. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, then we built those, those uh, you know, it was always building the little cars, you know, with that buggy coach wheels, you know, and just coaster cars, not at soapbox sturdy, nothing fancy, just just a, a one by 12 and with a two by four across, you know in a curtain rod to put the wheels on and you'd go down the go down the hill there and have the kind of a break thing you figured out. And so was, fortunately we didn't get terribly hurt because there was a circle at the end. You kind of you had to get around that before you got down by the lake. And um, so it was just it was just a wonderful place, but also we would uh, stop in and get sit up there in the trees and just eat oranges and tangerines after school when they'd first get wiped because that was exciting. Um, the other thing that happened on Highway 19 is there was uh, um, down the road yeah, they built a new place called the A and W, um, and that place that <clears throat> there's, there's a, a wonderful Catholic family, and <laughs> they had these most beautiful girls, <laughs> beautiful women. Good, beautiful girls. Everybody knew about the beautiful Walshmet girls. And uh, one of them, I was just in fourth grade. I think it was fourth. Yeah, it was fourth grade out on the playground. I had made this connection with this, this cute girl, and um, her name was Loretta. And I think I was, I was just nuts about her. Yeah. I was in love with her until. She dumped me for this guy called Bernie Higgins. <laughs> she she went off she went off to uh, I guess some Catholic school someplace. I guess you know beat away at the team. So I lost lost her, and I remember <clears throat> my mom would constantly quote me years later when I say, and I was so sad. Oh, there's there's never going to be anyone like Loretta. <laughs> <laughs> so every time a girl would dump me, she would remind me of that. <laughs> yeah, there are other girls. <laughs> There's some other girls out on the road. But anyway, so, and I always say that with hesitation, but she's here to match. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, junior high was, you know, the bus rides and all. We're, we're always fun. The, one time we had a bus. Uh, the bus stop in front of the place on 19, and, and the uh, <laughs> and the, our goat, nanny goat called Annie, Annie the nanny goat. 
She came on and got up, jumped on the bus with us. <laughs> and so the traffic was stopped at 19 while, while everybody scrambled trying to get this goat off the bus. We went on the neighbor's dog, Joni, this, this um, I can't remember the name of the doctor, the type of doctor, uh, was on there, and she wouldn't get off either. She wanted to be with her kids. And uh, so we had to scramble and get her off the bus so we could go on. Mrs. Welch was the bus driver. Life was just great. Just, just, <laughs> just good. And um, it, not always that good. I remember the in high school. Uh, well, in junior high, we were, it was the beginning of integration. And as far as my, well, my experience goes, was, was there weren't any issues at all. Uh, it was, it was, no, because in Tarpon Springs, that's one thing I'm very proud of Tarpon Springs, the diversity, the, 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 the Greeks, the, the, the blacks, and the whites have always gotten along really, really well. Unlike when I'm talking about further down 19, where they do cross springs there at Tampa Road, and uh, the crazy Luna Keeper's head of the plane. And, but, and then in high school, uh, they were doing a, George Wallace is running, you know, segregation, now segregation forever is focus. So I, I can't remember his slogan, the three words that, that put it all together again. And so there were the Palm Harbor boys. They weren't, they weren't quite so diverse down there. Hmm? They were not nearly as civilized as people are. So, so they were really, uh, agitators for that. And, and I remember I pulled down one of the, they had put up George Wallace stickers uh, around the school. I got very, take him on down and, and uh, the, the guy got in my face and yelled at me and said I was a nigger dog. No. And that was something I'm still pretty proud of. <laughs> it's funny, I don't know why that's, I don't know why that's so important to me. Cool to say I, but it all, you know, it all worked out. And by the time we were out of school, everybody was doing great. And uh, we all, for my class back in, you know, from our class, it was, we all got along. You know, there wasn't any real trouble like there was maybe later on when we got into all the busing stuff and all that. But, so it wasn't always so perfect, but, um, but relatively speaking, it was good. Um, Oh, to the Greek ladies, um, Sunset, <laughs> Sunset Beach. The Greek ladies, the thing I remember is that at low tide, the Greek ladies would be out there with their skirts, and, you know, someone would be held, you know, holding their, their dresses up, waiting around, and they would tow, you know, the little things, to, you know, uh, buckets for the, for the scholars. And, and the like, yeah, so it was, yeah, the wash tubs. That, What'd you call it? You'd call it a worst tub? <laughs> what did you say? A worst tub? That's kind of, that's kind of a Yankee <laughs> thing. <laughs> Do the worst? No, it's washed. They were washed tubs. <laughs> anyway, um, there was one more thing that you had said that I thought, no, I need to say something about that. But I think I'm, I'm looking at kind of my list of things I have dumb things to say, and and I think it's getting late, and so we should probably break it up, and uh, I'll say one last thing that um, my mom said. She would always, she was an English teacher, she was also uh, minored in philosophy, she was a philosopher kind of thing, so was my dad for that matter, but, but she would always quote, and this is the right translation, but from the yearling, she loved the yearling at least. And uh, that whole story, Cross Creek, was kind of our, kind of where we were, and and um, more or less. And she would say, "Life wasn't easy, but it was good." So, you have any questions? Oh, did you want to? Excuse me. Did you want to say anything more? We'll follow up later. Yeah. So, yes. And so, I should be with one more little bit again. The. So my grandparents' house was on the bayou. We always, because my grandfather was European, we had to have Sunday dinner. The whole family had to have Sunday dinner together. And then um, afterwards, they'd sit on the veranda porches, and the kids were, there was so little traffic back then. 
it would take my uncle Tommy and my dad a pretty smart thing to say, okay, you guys, um, the first guy that can see an out state tag, you get a dollar. <laughs> Well, there weren't a lot of state tags. <laughs> so, or any other tags, for that matter. So then, my cousin Tommy, who was always a little bit licensed, and you know, we were happy to follow them. And you remember some things he used to throw on the ground and they pop? Like, and he just pop like that. Well, cousin Tommy got the idea that we would line him up across the street. And there was no cars back then. So we, we could just sit in the street and line these things up. And then uh, we, we get them all lined up and we go back to the porch and we sit there with my dad, my Tommy, and my mom, and I'll go. And uh, what do you think the first car that comes by? Oh, uh, the police come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hits those things. <laughs> and uh, we could slam on the brakes. And uh, before my, my brother, my cousin, my physical time, we fall and you know, I had a wash house that, that <coughs> was attached to the house because it was in the back of the house, and they had this tool cut. So we ran in there and, and hid, and then uh, I'm sure it was mine at the time that couldn't stop, but you know, the first thing you know, here, here we could see, you know, it was a lattice work, and you could see, and here comes the blue pants and black shoes. <laughs> Then these pimp boys come out of there. And, uh, <laughs> so they did my dad and my uncle, man. I mean, it, was, it was kind of a joke. They told them they're back there in the wash house, you know, whatever the police would lay by. So anyway, he, he gave us a stern talking to that I wasn't nice. And, and my, <laughs> anyway, it scarred me for life. <laughs> so that's it. So I thought we needed a little humor. And, uh, I, signed, I was signed up for an hour, and it's been two. So. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, you, well, I uh, just wanted to thank you both uh, because, I mean, if you ask this question, when does the concept of holy structures is up on you? I think what the tales that you just told make us feel whole more than ever. So thank you for that. I have two, a couple of questions. Uh, I, I think this should probably continue another round of this at some future date because John, I'm a little disappointed that <laughs> did not. Same things never change. <laughs> did not show us about casket. Like that's one thing I think is a big, it's a rare thing to know how to cast it. And I know that your son personally um, shocked his Tampa friends, having been a genuine and all that. Because they said they saw him cast it, and they're like, "You are crazy, man! Where did you learn how to do this?" Well, I think that's a fascinating topic: how to do a cast it. So, and also, I think would be very interesting to share your tales about Mary and Beckett, and how you had these ideas as a young man to start art show. So, in the future, maybe that could be something worth doing. And Andy, I just wanted to say, um, I think I've said this before to you and maybe in other formats, that when I first came to Park and Spring as its artist in residence back in the 70s, I met your dad and everybody talked to Mr. Hoffman and also to John Terry to start the ad show. And your dad told me, he said, Elizabeth, we need somebody here in this town to be an artistic dictator. <laughs> which I didn't want to be that, but he had this wisdom and insight to say we need to do direction, which you very well have done. This is my text, so I appreciate that. Um, and he told me that, uh, your dad, Mr. Hoffman, told me that when he was a young man, the Tampa International Airport was a cow pest. Yeah. So that's kind of fascinating to know. And Additionally, your dad created blueprints for me to help hang a work that's at Camp International Airport, Birds Leading Earth, which I painted in City Hall. But I said, what, how do we, how do, will you help me hang this thing? And he said, well, Elizabeth, it's just a picture, just in your big picture frame. And he figured out how to install that thing. And during the installation of it, because he was an older man, gentleman, there was some ages, he knew how to do it, 
but nobody was listening to you. So, you know, other people were going, oh, you do this, you do that, they couldn't do it. But he knew the answers. So, thanks. I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Anita. Good job. First of all, I want to say thank you, and let's do this again. And congratulations on your daughter's upcoming year. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank John Lincoln's group because we met at First Main Street program. He came very outstanding. She calls the Timothy and he's a bit he's a cousin, he's a bit more big. That stood behind them and he had had the best Main Street programs in the United States. I want to thank you for having the cats come on in hand because she brought a lot of money to the department care and preserve this city home. Mm -hmm. And grants are important. And uh, I want John to tell some more of his stories. And any of you can tell him about to tell us a story about the father and the airplanes Boy. and the uh, end year, the anniversary, and what it's meant to our community. But when we were building our house, uh, the city went to the drugstore one day to see George and he says, Stop your product building the lot. And George says, Well, wait, we're standing in a couple of these bones. And he says, We're going to have to do something, please. And he says, That's because there's too many bones up there. And George says, Well, what do you think it is? He says, Well, no, well, what it was, the soft ones buried all the dead dogs on our And he never told us. And they were picking up all of the dog's bones. <laughs> Just under the oak tree there. I didn't know they were being dug up, but rest in peace so much from that. <laughs> so, does anybody else? Carl, did you have a question? No. Uh, is Carl still here? Just set it up. Well, it shows me we have a very unique community here. Yeah. We're, we're, we have a kind of mix. But we don't let them interfere with our French cooks and our lives. We have a good community, and people come down, and they don't understand. We've got a long go with the black community, the green community, and the non the You are good French. Yes, we do. We've been blessed to the community, for sure. We remember that, and what we do in the I think, I think John and I are the youngest. You know, we started this Tales of Tarpon a while back, wanting to really, you know, document the people that have been part of this town and get their stories before they passed away, particularly before we lost those stories, the polite way of saying before they died. But so, so we've tried to try to do older people. Then we had COVID. We had a lot of great, great programs, Tales of Tarpon, and I mean, COVID kind of really, you know, put us threw this whole world into chaos, but so we stopped it, but wanted to get that cranked up again, and so that, so I said, John, come on, let's just, let's just do one and get one going again, and so I want to thank, thank uh, the whole society, our board and all, for, for helping make this all happen, and it's, it's, it's been great, but John and I, I have to say, John and I are the youngest people that have ever been part of the party. It's scary. I hope it doesn't mean anything. Like, we've documented ourselves before we pass away. Yeah, they are supposed to have old people, but that's not us. You know, you know it's strange. Life is so strange. Everybody knows that. When you get older, then you kind of say, when your parents pass away, that's fine when you say, no, I am the old guy, so. Um, anyway, with that, uh, it's late, and we're so, so grateful to all of you for coming. I didn't know if there's going to be three or four people, or are going to have people out in the streets. Uh, but, yeah. um, so this turned out just perfect, and all the, a lot of very special people out here, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, and by, and I, there's so many stories that came up when you talk about poppers, I was going to talk about going AWOL from the Boy Scouts. Can I, they were going to, I threw a popper down over at the Methodist Church before we were all going camp, and I threw poppers down, and, and it popped, and 
you know, and kind of like Lord of the Flies, you know, the boys, they, they, uh, they can be, they can be rough. And so they decided they were, well, listen, fireworks are illegal in the state of Florida. Let's put him through the belt line. And so I didn't want to do that. So I took off right and I went AWOL, ran up through this, all the neighbors goes back behind the church and they finally went all, all the way home and uh, never get back until Sea Scouts. And Sea Scouts was a great thing for all of us and we could talk about the Hawk for a long time. Here. So with that, I gotta shut up because you guys got to go. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.